Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone. We are halfway done with the off-season's projection special. We've got part five up right now, which is going to be the AFC North. Have Ben Gretsch here with me. Ben's been joining me all along. We've got the AFC and NFC East and West divisions done as well. So make sure you check out the Establish the Edge iTunes podcast for that. You can also check out the Establish the Run YouTube channel if you want to see our pretty faces. And you can check out all of Ben's work at bengretch.substack.com. Also, his podcast with Sean Siegel, Stealing Bananas, as part of the Rotoviz Radio Network. Ben, AFC North, let's dive into it. First team up, we're going to go with Baltimore. We have the play calling for them likely to change a lot from last year. And they were a good example last year. We touched on this on the last podcast of a team where like, you always want to regress teams somewhat, like especially these extreme teams. I think there's a tendency for people to be like, oh, you know, they ran the ball 55% of the time. They're going to do that every year. And the cast of the NFL season hits Baltimore it's running backs all go down. The team isn't as successful in the past and they have to throw a whole bunch uh, which you know makes this projection a little bit more difficult than maybe in years past. Incredibly tough. Um, I think last year when we talked about this, this was – I think I made a point this was like the one team that I was really confident on taking a pretty hard-line stance on their, on their team volume, and it was to be pretty run-heavy. They had been sub-50% in their cold pass rate in 2019 and 2020. That's incredibly low. It was at least seven percentage points of, of pass rate below expectation – uh, it was 7.5 in 2019, 10 percentage points below in 2020. This past year, they're all the way up from sub 50% pass rate to like 63%. And what's interesting about that is they were still slightly negative pass rate over expected. Like they yeah. had so much game script forcing that and the running back injuries and everything else. They've been typically very negative and they were just very, very slightly negative, like a fraction of a percent, very different you know, equation, but it's interesting that they were very high on the pass rate and still somewhat negative. And then you look at their Vegas win total this year and they're expected to be better, right? They're expected to bounce back. They're at, I think, nine and a half wins. They only won eight games last year. Obviously, Lamar gets hurt a little bit. That leans into the pass rate. They threw plenty when Lamar was in, but it was a, their pass rate was a little bit higher in the games that he missed. Um, yeah, like how far do you regress? Because I, I do think their offseason moves and everything points towards a team that wants to get back to running the ball. They drafted two more tight ends. They haven't addressed the, you know, the, the trade away Marquis Brown and haven't addressed that spot. So, I mean, we're looking at Devin DuVernay, James Proch, and, and <laughs> Tylen Wallace as their, one of those guys is going to be their number two receiver. Meanwhile, they have like, you know, they have Nick Boyle back and they're still drafting new tight ends. And they had Josh Oliver be somewhat decent last year. They have like five viable tight ends and not even five viable receivers so it's uh, a team that looks like they want to go back to the two tight end set stuff and, and run more on paper i think but also like they're a sharp analytical team and they made such a shift last year you gotta assume they're going to keep some of that i put them at the 58 percent pass rate you have them at 59.4 i thought i was maybe still high at 58 because again they they're two good years in 2019 2020 they were sub 50 percent I, I could see them at 55 percent you know or even yeah more. Yeah, it's possible they are even lower to put some numbers to what you're saying. Three seasons ago, had a 48% called pass rate with a negative 7.5% PROE. Two seasons ago, 49% called pass rate with a negative 10.2% PROE. Then last season, they come in at a 63% pass rate, just slightly under neutral PROE. And as you mentioned, I've got them at 59.4%. So that is a decent dip from last year, but... Maybe, maybe not enough when you look at they were right around 50%. So I think your 58% number, honestly, looking at it for a second time a little bit closer, may be a bit more accurate. As far as total plays called, I have them a little bit lower paced. And I think that goes hand in hand if they're going to be running the ball a little bit more. I'm um, just chewing a little bit more clock. They were, they've bounced around in place called the last few years. And it is something that's a lot more volatile, I think for the average team than people realize once you get past the teams on the outliers, but they had um, last season, they ran almost 70 plays per game, which is absurd. The year before that they were down to six, they were at 62 plays per game. Uh, looking at the play clock stuff, 
they were below average as in slower than average in terms of snapping the ball in neutral situations with time left on the play clock. So that's, that's probably, good. you I'm know, driving my stuff down a little bit. So, um, yeah, if we were to settle on some numbers, maybe closer to my plays and your pass, yeah, pass I percentage. That feels right. But then that, I mean, you get to a lot fewer passes than last year. You get to, mm -hmm. I just typed that in like closer to your plays. I'm getting down to like, Quite a few fewer dropbacks. You look at Lamar's scramble rate. So you wind up with this is called pass rate. Then you also have to factor in that Lamar scrambles at a really high rate. We might have slightly different numbers there, but that gets me to like 530 passes. They threw well over 600 times last year. A big part of Marcus uh, Mark Andrews' breakout was that he just he, he, his route percentage went way up, but then they also threw more. He ended up uh, running over 600 routes. His previous career high was 350. I mean, he just gained yeah. so many routes. We're talking about them not even throwing over 600, anywhere close to 600 passes. So he wouldn't be running anywhere near as many routes as last year. That's something we'll get to when we talk about the pass catchers. Yeah, I had them with a 6.8% sack rate, which is a little bit above league average. And then also a 10.2% scramble rate, which is you know one of the highest in the league. Right. Just have right by um, all of those numbers. Which makes sense because I have 542 pass attempts for the team and that's before maybe docking the pass rate even further. So yeah, there's a, so there is a little bit of a squeeze on pass attempts as far as fantasy for someone like Andrews, which we'll get to. I don't know if it's a huge deal because the, the concentration should, should be so high. Um, as far as Lamar, like I'm not really worried about him from a fantasy perspective. I'm really high on him. You're even higher on him looking at the, and that's, partially because you have some more rush work. Um, I probably was a little, I've been a little bit conservative sometimes with these quarterback rush shares, as we saw with the Trey Lance episode. So you have them for 178 rush attempts. I'm at more like 145 rush attempts, which is driving a pretty big difference in total fantasy points. And even with my more conservative projection, I have him like what easily in a top five quarterback. And as far as, at least as far as value goes, my, him and Kyler would be my favorite values of yeah. the top five quarterbacks right now. For sure. I, I have Lamar as QB2. We talked on the Lance episode about how getting to this 150 rush attempt number is huge. Lamar hit it in both 2019 and 2020 in 15 games both seasons. Um, obviously, we're playing a 17-game season now. He missed one game both those years. I think it was mostly week 17 back in the 16-game schedule. Ran for over a thousand yards. He had 176, 159 carries those two years. Last year, he only plays 12 games, has 133 carries. And basically, you know, right around where his career average has been. I do think you can say as he's getting older, maybe they'll cut that back a little bit. He had some injury issues last year. So maybe I'm a little bit hot there, but it is really crazy that I'm projecting 178 rush attempts. That's, I, I think, would be the most because Lamar is the only guy who's hit 150 in the last like. 15, 20 years. I was talking about that on the Lance episode. It would be his career high. So it's it's the most since probably whatever, whenever quarterbacks used to run more, like Otto Graham or something like that. You know, some, some, ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. some ridiculous quarterback a really long time ago. Uh, but I'm projecting it as, as his baseline. Like that's how absurd, you know, because we have the 17th game now. I mean, it, it's just, he's just, it adds a ton of value. He has 2,000 yard rushing seasons already. I'm projecting him to, to have a third. You've got him at 850, which is still a ton of rushing yards for a quarterback. So, you got, I, I mean, I really don't get why he doesn't go top three at quarterback. Yeah. I think in some of like FFPC, NFFC, where the passing yardage stuff's a little more favorable, I have him more like either four or five. But in standard leagues, I think he's actually our QB2, especially if you strip out the ADP, like being baked into that ranking. I'm um, just off pure projections. I think it's Allen and then Lamar Jackson. For us, uh, looking at the ground game, the difficult part here is just understanding the health and making some assumptions on the health of these guys. J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, they both got injured and tore their ACLs in the preseason. So it's good in terms of we've had a lot more time versus you think of someone like Michael Gallup or, or Chris Godwin. Those guys didn't have as much time to recover. However, Dobbins' injury, I believe, was like pretty severe, like more than just your traditional ACL tear. He's been someone we've been buying a lot because he's dipped into like the fifth, even sixth round at times. And for me, 
at that point, I love Dobbins because last year I thought Dobbins was really overvalued, especially early in the draft season when he was going in round two, where he doesn't have, you know, the stranglehold as far as like, he's not going to get a, all the rush attempts because he's going to split with Lamar and a little bit with Gus and he doesn't have a ton of pass catching upside. You move him to round five or six though, Ben, and all of a sudden the safety of the efficiency of this ground game and a team we expect to get back to it and a back who we do believe is talented. Like I start to like that bet a lot more, even with some of the health risk baked in. Yeah. I, I really like Dobbins at his cost now too. some conflicting reports. You know, we have heard that he might not be ready. And then he himself has said that we're going to find out what he, he and God have, have in store for us. So I'm excited to find out what uh, he and God have been cooking up. Yeah, so I think, you know, you get to end of five or six, I think I'm rolling the dice still. Maybe like early five or round four. I think there's some other options. Like you can go to Brees Hall sometimes at end of round four ahead of Dobbins, some things like that. I've been drafting Gus, though, a lot too because he's been basically free. And I think his injury was less severe. I expect him to be the clear backup if both him and Dobbins are healthy and if Dobbins is shaky. No, I mean, I think there's there's some I think Gus is a decent play. Like if we expect this offense to operate like they did more two yeah. to three years ago, there's going to be running back fantasy points on the ground. Just yards per carry is going to be high. Touchdown rates are going to be high or, or Beatty, who you have projected a little higher than me. But even, you know, really late, th this is a team that will use multiple backs. Certainly if Dobbins is not fully healthy early, there might or Edwards, there might be more opportunity for Beatty to get in there early. I kind of think the addition of Mike Davis makes that tough for Beatty in the early season stuff that they'll probably go with the vet. They did that last year with Tyson Williams, not really trusting him and, and instead going with some, you know, some potentially washed up vets. Mm -hmm. and Latavius Murray there giving a bunch of carries to Devonta Freeman played pretty well, but you know, they were Le'Veon Bell. They brought in, were playing over Tyson. So maybe they brought in Mike Davis cause they, you know, they'll want that veteran presence if Dobbins and Edwards aren't healthy, but um, so I'm not, yeah, gonna, as thrilled on Beatty as a late round guy, but uh, I, I, yeah, I'm with you. There's there's ways to play his backfield. We kind of thumbed the scale a little bit, you know, the term that you were using to, to get Beatty kind of as a round 18 guy in our ranks to just like people can take it or leave it. But I'm a little bit more pessimistic as well in terms of the upside here, just because I think if he were to get work and come early in the season where it's not as valuable, and they, they brought in Corey Clement as well, which that's part of the reason why we docked, you know, our Dobbins projections a little bit more conservative than yours. We're down to 166 rush attempts. You have 198. So we did back off Dobbins a little bit on the Clement signing um, until we get some more positive news. Still like him again in that range, but I'm kind of with you where, I don't know. I think there's other backs I'd, I'd rather gamble on than Beatty late right now. Yeah. There's some sharp people I know that are on him, but that's, that's sort of where I fall to. Yeah. I think JJ Zacharyson's a pretty big Beatty fan. Uh, me and Silver were doing a live draft stream, and he was telling us to take Beatty over Snoop Connor. Uh, let's go to the receivers, though. So Rashad Bateman had, I guess overall, I'd say disappointing rookie season. He spent some time hurt, and then when he came back, he didn't. We just kind of expected him to dust Sammy Watkins right away, and he didn't quite do that. Um, but man, they really made a statement trading Marquise Brown. They don't re-sign Sammy Watkins. Bateman was a guy they spent a lot of draft capital on, was an analytics darling. And the runway just seems absolutely clear from him, which really, to me, it, it you know, almost completely alleviates those concerns from year one, where now I'm just like, okay, we liked this prospect and he has all the opportunity in the world. Uh, the hype on him's high though. So like, as far as how actionable that is in drafts, I want to like Bateman more con more than like my exposures kind of have been just because like FFPC now he's up to wide receiver 25, which is like, that's, that's pretty early for an offense. We don't expect to throw a lot. I think the market is a little too hot on both him and Andrews relative to some of what we talked about with the play volume regression, which is not just the pass rate stuff. It's what you also said. Their plays were incredible. They led the league by a lot last year. That's got to regress. If the pass volume also, or the, pass rate also regresses which it could again just because they win more games which they're expected to i mean basically the expectation should be play volume is coming down and pass rate is coming down but the market is sort of what you know tends to just look at sort of you know last year's opportunity or available right. targets targets i 
I really like Bateman, but he's going like the highest we ever saw Marquise Brown go. And Marquise Brown was good in this offense when it was lower volume, but not necessarily like a smash in those ranges. I, it's it's tough because Bateman is a really really good prospect, as you said, really well rounded player, tons of opportunity. I'm definitely going to take some of him. I don't think we're getting as much of a discount as I think we should be getting. Yeah. We're definitely aligned there. Look at the other options. I think all the other options are really just best ball only. Like, I don't think they have the type of upside that I need, you know, to be stashing and redraft would probably rather stash a running back lottery ticket, especially, you know, kind of the way we draft, which is we're filling out some pretty you know, high draft capital and wide receiver and taking a lot of dart throws at running back. We actually just updated our projections today for Baltimore. For a while, we had unlisted wide receiver with a lot of targets for Baltimore, just kind of waiting for them to sign someone. You know, Julio finally signs elsewhere, and we sort of decided, like, okay, at this point, we got to start shifting some of this volume to guys that are actually on the team. Tried to look at it a little bit closer. The guy I want it to be, which is probably the guy you want it to be, is Tylen Wallace, who was a fun prospect, goes to the right organization, probably has the most upside out of him, Devin Duvernay, and James Proche. The issue is he seems like he's lowest in the depth chart right now. Deverne is the safest for targets. I think he's going to be on the field. I just don't know if there's any semblance of ceiling for Deverne. Anything to add on the wide receiver grouping behind well, Bateman? I know Deverne in his prospect profile, there was a lot of talk. He had a, a lot of catches at Texas. A lot of it was like design stuff really close to the line of scrimmage. He's a very explosive player. They used him on a lot of like jet motion and some handoffs and some short stuff in the past. Mm -hmm. His A dot's pretty low. I, I mean, I think there's a, the, I, I think you said it really well. I don't think there's really a ceiling for him. I don't know that he's really a well rounded receiver necessarily. I think the swings are on Wallace or even Proche, but I'm with you where, where you said sort of this is not really a passing game that I want to be taking shots on late. I don't really expect it to yeah. be deep enough. If you look at the years where they didn't run a ton, I mean, throw a ton in 2019, 2020. It's mostly Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews and then not a lot else there. And uh, that's sort of what I'm expecting out of, you know, Bateman and Andrews really kind of concentrating most yeah. of the volume. Yeah. Like if I'm feeling real saucy in a best ball mania draft, I might take a stacked Tylen Wallace in round 18. But that's like that that's what it would have to be for me to really be going here. And to put numbers on the Bateman stuff, we have them around 110 targets, which you know, um, just isn't that high. So Marquise Brown last year, I should have looked this up before the show, but you know what? We do things on the fly here. Marquise Brown last season had 146 targets. So I mean, we're projecting a huge drop off, but, even though we like Bateman. What did he have the years prior? So he had a hundred targets in 2020. So we're, this yeah. is more like 2020 Marquise Brown is right. what we're looking at. And, and Bateman um, only had a 15.9% targets per out run last year. Even though he wasn't necessarily getting as many routes as we wanted to see, he couldn't push Watkins aside. He also wasn't earning a ton of volume per route. That's not bad for a rookie. He can certainly move up from that. He was coming off an injury, he missed a lot of the season. It's a you know, relatively small sample. But like a lot of the other rookies that, that we're excited about, the Elijah Moores, Amon Ross St. Browns, those guys were up over 20% targets per out run, not down at 16%. So, Again, mm -hmm. Bateman, really good prospect, still really like him. It does feel a little bit like a two-step where you've got to get the volume side of the offense right, and you've got to be right that Bateman is good because he didn't – like you said, he didn't. He had a disappointing rookie season for sure. Mark Andrews. Now, so I'm behind market on Bateman. I actually don't mind being with market or a little ahead on Andrews, even though we are expecting the team pass volume to come down quite a bit. And there's a couple reasons why. One, unlike with Bateman, like we know Andrews is very good. Um, target per route run stuff, yard per target stuff, all really strong. Uh, yep. We know he's going to have a high touchdown total. And there's also this positional edge where if you're trying to get a positional edge at tight end, you know, maybe you miss a little bit, but you still have like a pretty big edge just because tight end, something we've really hit on after the top five guys or so, you know, you're almost <laughs> waiting to tight end 15 plus at that point um, with, with the way we kind of see the tight end landscape. So I do like Andrews. You have him for 139 targets. I have 122. And I think your number could very well be accurate. We run a little bit more conservative. 
but that's a scaled target share of just like 22 and a half percent for Andrews is what we have. And I mean, quite frankly, with what they have in this offense right now, it wouldn't be shocking to see Andrews 25 plus percent. Like yeah. This. So I took him at 26 on that exact logic. That's where, that's where I have him. Um, I was worried about Andrews throughout most of the offseason for the team level stuff, the, the really extremely high play volume and expecting the pass rate to come down and kind of like, I, I don't really want to be in on him at price. I, you know, I, I come on, on your show and I, I always have to throw in, oh, I don't really trust projections in this and that, even though we're doing a whole show on projections. Andrews is a guy where I did the projection and I looked at where I felt comfortable with his target share and I went really aggressive with it because his route, it's not just that they threw more last year. It said his route percentage was often in the like 70% of dropbacks range. And it got really, really good last year in, 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 as well as the added routes. And so if he could do that when they're dropping back 45 times, there was concern about like his diabetes and stuff. Maybe he would never be that guy necessarily. It never really seemed to make sense to me, but he was clearly that guy last year in a really aggressive passing offense. So when I go back and I do this projection for Andrews, I come out looking at it and I go, there's not a lot of tight ends that I like the way that, I mean, even if I'm not super high on their pass rate, he still comes out really, really good. And we, he, like you said, we know he's really good after earning the target, and he's already shown an ability to earn a ton of targets. He's an efficient player. I, I don't want to not be on Andrews. There's only maybe two other tight ends, Kelsey and Pitts, that I think have his ceiling. And something else you've pointed out to me in the past is as we get a lower pass volume offense – it's more likely to see the volume kind of concentrate. Yeah. Um, so we like Andrews, I mean, even, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if he could put up a 30% target share. Like it's, it's a little out there, but I honestly, I think it's in the range of outcomes if we have like a real low pass volume offense, yep. but it's basically like Andrews Bateman, Andrews Bateman. I mean, a lot of the Bateman hype is they traded Marquise Brown because they thought Bateman was their wide receiver one. What if the more accurate thing is they traded Marquise Brown because they think Mark Andrews is their wide receiver one and they think Bateman can can be a good number two, basically, because yeah, that might be the way to, to view Mark Andrews. He's been that good. We'll go to Cincinnati next. We are in lockstep on the pass rate, which is 61.5% our projections. Cincinnati was, you know, kind of infuriating at times last year. We really wanted them to open it up. And every time they did, and we were like, okay, they're they're realizing what they have here, uh, it would just kind of revert back. So it's really funny. You have a stretch of games where they're like very consistently like around a zero percent PROE or slightly negative, and then two in a row they're at 10%. You know, it comes back down for a stretch of games. Two in a row, they're at 15%. Oh, it, it comes back down again. They were pretty positive. They were positive all three games in the playoffs, which is a good sign. Um, actually, they play, they play four playoff games. Yeah. They played four playoff games. Raiders, um, Titans. Oh, I don't think I have the Super Bowl data up. I think I just have the pre-Super Bowl data. Um, that's probably what I'm missing. But they were, yeah, so they were at least leading up to the Super Bowl, the three playoff games in the AFC. They were positive. Not crazy. I don't know. At the end of the day, it just Zach Taylor just kind of seems like the type of coach that's going to be, I think, a little bit more in that McVay line where he's going to play it pretty tight according to game script. Every now and then, you know, he gets in the matchup. I think he's smart enough to throw a bit more, but I don't think they're ever going to be super pass heavy over the duration of the season. One spot we do disagree a bit is on plays run. Um, this is one of our bigger discrepancies. You have 64.6. I have 62.5. League average is about you know right in the middle of those two numbers. Yeah, so starting, I I pulled up starting uh, week five through the playoffs, which ends up being seventeen games, and, and throwing out the first month where they were really slow paced. Burrow wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. fully healthy. Their plays were up at sixty four point one. They were. Uh, 61.9 for the regular season. So that was more than two plays per game by, you know, adding in the playoffs and taking out the first month. And, and instead of looking at the regular season, looking at this other, you know, 17 game stretch that, that I want to look at more because I want to be higher on the Bengals. Um, <laughs> and they were also their pass rate over expected in that stretch was plus 2.2 .2 as opposed to just plus 0.8 for the season. So if you pull out those first four games and you say, okay, Burrow wasn't fully healthy for the first month. And we knew that going in. I mean, I remember it, it last offseason I was saying, 
I'm not counting on Burrow for the first four games. Week four is when I want to see that he's good to go. And they open it up a little bit. I think they had a soft schedule early. I, but I, I remember kept – the reason I remember this is it ended up being very accurate, right, that I was I was calling week four the the important week, and that was really the week where they sort of, sort of started to turn it on, or week five is when they started to turn it on a little bit more. Um, lucky guess. But I my point is we were sort of expecting that coming in. That was the talk in, for, about Burrow at this time last year was that they weren't – you know, he wasn't fully healthy. He wasn't even comfortable in, in training camp. From week five through the rest of the year, and, and you talked about how they're a little more pass heavy in the playoffs. They were a little bit faster paced. They were a little bit pass rate, uh, you know, positive to the pass rate over expected side. So that's kind of what I'm leaning on to, to say that they're going to be a little more aggressive. And also just like they're playing in a competitive ASC East. I think they, I mean, I think, I, I guess it's sort of what I think they should do or want to do. But if you want to keep up with the Chiefs, you want to keep up with the Bills. We're doing this with the Chargers. We're saying they, they got to keep up. They got to throw a ton, right? Stadium's yeah. a little sharper. I think you might be right on Taylor. He might be a l- not quite that aggressive, but I'm gonna put I'm gonna move him up more to like 63. I think I'm still gonna keep him a little below average. Some of the play clock stuff over the duration of the season wasn't super great in their favor. Um, but yeah, I do think making the point about the first month of the season's valid. So I'm gonna move him up a little bit there. Uh pre-moving them up, though, it does net out to about a pass play per game and a rush play per game different. And uh, you know, that and just really big efficiency differences on Burrow. You have him quite a bit higher. I've struggled with Burrow where we've got his ceiling case boosted up pretty high because we know he could have a season like last year based on the talent at his disposal where the efficiency could be off the charts and the fact that he doesn't run a ton and, you know, it just doesn't matter that much. But it is kind of hard for a quarterback who doesn't run a ton and isn't on one of these real fast paced, high PROE offenses to crack the top six. And the draft markets have, have, they've like caught on a bit. Like he was going way too early at the very beginning of the draft season. Now he's QB seven, which like rank wise might be all right, but I'm kind of just on, you know, the tier we hit on the other day, like kind of like Lance Brady, Dak, Russ, like those guys, I think I'd, I'd rather take. So he completed more than 70% of his passes last year, which was ridiculous. Chase actually had some pretty big drops issues. You know, we talked about that in, in training camp and, and why to fade it. He actually had quite a few drops in season. No one really cares because he was Jamar Chase. T Higgins, obviously not healthy the whole year. One of the really crazy stats on Burrow I tweeted the other day was that all three of the running backs had catch rates of 87% or better. The average running back catch rate is usually about 75%. So the way I think about that is about a quarter of their passes end up going incomplete for one reason or another. For all three Cincinnati running backs, it was basically half of that, half of the, the incompletions that you would expect. All of them had at least 17 targets too. This isn't like, you know, a five target sample. 17 is not a ton, but Chris Evans was the low guy at 17. P Ryan was just over 20. I think Mixon obviously a lot higher. They're all catching a ton. They catch 84 out of 96 combined running back targets. That's an absurd amount. And then you go back and you think, okay, CEH had this really great receiving profile in college that we haven't seen play out in the NFL. How much did Burrow have to do with that? There's some guys that just deliver the ball really, really well. That was a Drew Brees trait for so many years. He's the first guy that ever cracked 70% completion percentage. I I think what we're we're seeing in Burrow's early career is that he's just really, really good. Uh, Shout out Scott Barrett when I tweeted that, replied that, that Burrow was really good in his depth adjusted completion percentage numbers or, or whatever he was looking at, I think led the league. So it's not just you know throwing to the running backs, but he's somebody who delivers a ball at all depths incredibly accurately. And he has so much talent around him. Uh, I do think the running back thing's pretty notable though. There's some quarterbacks that are good for running back receptions. I think that's good for Mixon, a guy I'm not usually on. I think it's good for Evans, uh, but I'm happy to be, I'm not, drafting like a ton of burrow but i'm happy to be a little bit higher on his efficiency because i do think he's an incredibly good passer based on what we've seen so far statistically and i mean there is also the chance that you know i'm wrong on zach taylor and they do run at a faster pace clip and they do finally kind of unleash him over a full season you know we we did at least see the proe spikes scattered throughout the year um even though they never stuck around so they stick around or just happen a little bit more frequently um, that's good. Talking about Mixon, I'm more aggressive on him, have him about 20 fantasy points per game 
more. A lot of that looks to be that I don't have him splitting as much rush work as you do. Um, I've got about 28 more rush attempts for Mixon, and it kind of just seems like you've got those spread out between Chris Evans and P. Ryan. So that's that's one of our, um, I wouldn't say a huge difference, but I've got him at a pretty healthy, like 68% I, carry share, which I is pretty really, full. Yeah, I, I, I could have went higher on Mixon. I, I do come in typically like 60th percentile with some of my projections we've joked. Um, but when it comes to workhorse running backs, that's where I don't get to the 60th percentile because I'm, I'm a zero RB bro. Um, it's kind of like I don't want to project 300 touches for a running back. I'm just not comfortable doing that. So I, I definitely see that with Mixon. I, I felt – better about considering Mixon in drafts after doing his projection and seeing how big his workload could be, even though I come in lower than you. Yeah, he, he had a 70.5% carry share last year. But again, the things happen over the course of the season that it's hard to to bank on that. We've got him again, 67.5% carry share right now. He is somewhat tough to get a handle on where I think... Like, I think he's fine, I guess, is where I put it, like where he's going. I'd rather have, you know, DeAndre Swift, where we have like this huge pass catching ceiling. But I also think Mixon caught enough in base. You know, like, I think he can be a 10% target share guy, even if we've got P. Ryan or Evans taking the third down work, that it's not a zero in the past game. And there's just confidence for me in this offense. And I mean, that's kind of sometimes the death uh, wish for running back when you're like, well, the offense is going to be good and the offense isn't good and you're kind of screwed, but just the youth and the talent in this offense. And then they're starting to revamp the offensive line. Um, like we've got mixing ahead of Derek Henry, for example, um, which is, you know, definitely different than where the market is. That's the backup. A... Sorry. No, that, that, I mean, that's, that's a good note. <laughs> the, um, so we've got him RB8, and he's he's going as RB8, at least like I'm, I'm just looking at the FFPC leagues. And a lot of the ADP I'll reference, again, is the FFPC online championship leagues, because for me, that's where we get the tweener ADP of sharp drafters, but like some casual drafters, whereas like underdog is kind of, it's, it's completely its own world. So I'm trying not to reference those too much. And the fantasy pros casual league ADP also is sort of its own world and not really like molded into shape quite yet one of the big things with Mixon, i would just add he, he had never had 10 tds in a season their offense had never really been that great he has 16 last year in a projection he's not going to necessarily project for 16 we both have him right around 11 to 11 and a half um that's still a pretty good number for a running back but we think this offense is going to be really good i could see him having 15 tds again the, the receiving side is, you know, a little more concerning. You're going to go into the backup running backs. I think Evans is really interesting. He was really uh, explosive in the limited receiving work that he had, had over 10 uh, yards per reception. Again, they were all good because they, they caught a lot of their passes, and apparently Burrow was delivering them very well. Both Mixon and Pirine had good efficiency as receivers as well, outside of the catch rate, just like yards per reception. But uh, Evans was the best in in sort of all those. And again, small sample. But um, if, he, if he cuts into the third down work and all that, Mixon's going to need probably 15 touchdowns to to meet his ADP, I think. So um, how you play those two is interesting. Yeah, and I've struggled with Evans. We've been behind the market on him. And part of that is, man, if I'm drafting, especially in best ball, if I'm drafting, you know, kind of, a handcuff. I mean, it's not a handcuff running back because we think there's going to be value in the passing game. But I, if I'm drafting a backup running back, like I kind of want to be sure that I'm drafting the right one. And even though Evans is the more explosive guy, it's almost like you have to be right in a couple of ways. Like you have to be right that, you know, to hit the pure upside, you have to be right that Mixon gets hurt. But then you got to be right that that work goes to Evans and not P. Ryan. And I guess I'm just not, haven't seen enough to convince me that Evans I is ahead of P. Ryan yet. Yeah, I would go so far as to say that I think if Mixon gets hurt, Piran probably takes the early work and Evans takes the receiving work. But in this offense, they, they might throw more, first of all, without Mixon. And and Evans might still get some rushes. And in this offense, being the pass catching back in that setup might be pretty pretty useful, but maybe more like a you know high-end Naheem Hines season as opposed to mm -hmm. like a three-down star. 
And I do think in managed leagues, it's always a little bit easier to go with guys you have a nice upside feeling on because you could just drop them week one. You know, if P, if, P, if you draft Evans and P Ryan's ahead, like you could take the gamble now because you can just churn it in, into a different lottery ticket later, uh, which is different than best ball where obviously you can't churn. Okay, let's go to the wide receiver grouping. And what's nice about this offense, even though there are like five main guys, or I guess I'd say four main guys in Chase, Higgins, Boyd, and Mixon. They don't mess around on the periphery too much, Ben, which yeah. gives you that perfect mix. We talked about it with the Raiders a little bit where you're concentrated enough in base that the competition doesn't matter. Maybe even helps a little bit because the offense is going to roll. And you do have the, you know, anti-fragile upside that, you know, T Higgins gets hurt and now Jamar Chase is seeing, you know, 160 targets and it's just an absolute, absolute smash. Uh, that's you have been, That's been the sorry. staple of, of McVay's offenses with the Rams for a long time, the 11 personnel. That was really exciting in the first few years of McVay's coaching career. He moved away from it a little bit at times in the last couple of years, uh, you know, sort of after they lost to the uh, the Patriots in that Super Bowl. They, they started to try to do, do some different things, but Taylor had moved on already. I remember, I, I don't know if he, you know, Taylor finished or the Bengals finished most 11 personnel in the league last year, but I know at a stretch during the season, I remember they were incredibly high. And I was like, man, Taylor's Bengals are the new McVay's Rams because McVay's Rams weren't quite running 11 personnel as much, but you get this really concentrated high 11 personnel usage. It's the same five guys, you know, skilled guys on the field every time um, for the most part, maybe a little bit of switching out the running back on passing downs, but the same three receivers, the same tight end. That's really beneficial to know for a for a fantasy offense. Yeah, and in base, I pretty much have the target shares where they were last year. You've got it a little bit higher on Chase and Higgins, and I can see that because they're both so talented. Uh, I'm not sure if that happens in base. Just you know, sometimes those guys just get capped out at a certain point. But it's really exciting for me. Chase, kind of no matter where I put him, like I think he's behind Cup and Jefferson for me. Um, so the note I have on him, he had almost nine targets a game in the four playoff games. He also only played five snaps in week 18. If you take uh, out week 18, you include the playoff games, you go to a 17-game pace. It's more like 135 targets, and he had actually 143 over the last 17 full games, basically week 14 through the playoffs. Again, if I do what I did earlier and I rip out week weeks one through three, he had a couple low-target games because they were playing a lot slower. I just say his last 17 full games of his rookie year and include the playoffs, which is probably more relevant in my mind. It is that, you know, he was growing through his rookie season. Uh, that huge volume in the playoffs drove this for me. So I have met 145 targets that 143 he had over his last 17 full games, a big part of that. Yeah. So him and T I think are great. Again, Chase, I think, I mean, would you, you'd have him at wide receiver three though, all said and done or. I do. Yeah, I do. But the there's a lot of people that I've heard and, and seen in drafts that are letting him fall out of the top five. Like it's a clear top four and he's not a part of the top five. And I I'm just strongly in, in disagreement with that. Yeah. I, I agreed. Think I think he has to go fifth. I mean, cause there's still ceiling. Like I basically put him in his targets where they were in the last 17 games, like I said. Right. But there's this potential that Jamar chase, you know, best prospect ever who had an incredible rookie year all the way through the playoffs when teams are trying to stop him goes on into year two and is even better. Right. I mean, yeah. this guy could just be an absolute, you know, all time there's, receiver. There's definitely part of me that wants to be, take him as a wide receiver one. It's just cup and Jefferson are so like in any other year, but like with cup and I shouldn't say any other years, like we had the Antonio Brown years and stuff, but, um, the role for cup just absolutely insane. And then Jefferson is, you know, in, in some ways like, you know, a good Doesn't prospect. Care. Now he's got two years of productivity <laughs> yeah. and instead of one. And it's like, and uh, it's unfortunate. Le yeah. I mean, and less competition. Potentially the offense taking off in the way that the Bengals did, because they now have O'Connell who had the, you know, has the same Rams ties. Right. But Adam Thielen is a little is aging and is less of a threat than T Higgins is. And so, I mean, you can, Jefferson is great too. You got three really good receivers at the top, but that's the why for me the emphasis is Chase still belongs in the top five. Hundred percent agree. Looking at tight end, 
or I, I'll just note that we have, we each have Tyler Boyd for like 95 targets. And for me, that has made him basically like, um, like fine where he goes. Uh, I think positionally he's going about accurate. I don't know. I know you, you like Boyd though, if I recall correctly. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's still, he's not like that old. He's still sort of in his prime. We talked about the contingent based upside for Chase and Higgins. I think either of them goes down. The other one is an absolute, absolute smash regardless. I mean, right. Higgins on his own, in his own profile, looks fantastic. So something were to happen to Chase Higgins is going to be amazing. I still really like Higgins very early in drafts as well. He comes out very high in my projection. I do have the play volume maybe a little bit high, but he comes out, uh, you know, right up there, in the, definitely in the top 10. Boyd, to me, would benefit from either of them missing time. The, the, you know, yeah. Chase goes down, Higgins is a star, but Boyd is also coming up quite a bit. Boyd's a good receiver in his own right. He's that sort of high uh, high floor or small miss big hit type of type of play. I would say I think there's still room for him to actually have a really big type of hit in this offense with Burrow if he has to be leaned on more as that second weapon. Um, yeah, I mean, I just I still think he's a really talented player. Are you drafting Hayden Hurst at all anywhere? Um, not really. What yeah. we saw with Uzama, like he hasn't done a lot in his own career. What we saw with Uzama last year was basically situationally because he's going to be out there so much in that 11 personnel stuff. He's going to have some splash games, but Uzama's overall line wasn't like anything to write home about. There's definitely potential in like late in, in basketball stacks to tack on Hayden Hurst because he could have a two touchdown game because he is going to run probably enough routes, but he's not going to earn volume over these receivers. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. A stacked tight end three in best ball is fine, and that's probably uh Probably where we're at. And Uzama too, just, I mean, he, he, he performed well above his opportunity would indicate, which yep. is worth pointing out. Cause he's just wide open sometimes. I mean, he had a couple, <laughs> a couple times where defenses were like, we're not even paying attention to this guy. So we'll go over to Cleveland, which is a difficult team to project. I have it projected right now about two thirds as if Deshaun Watson was playing. Ben has it projected as if it's all Jacoby Brissett. So I think that's an interesting comparison to see how things change between the two we have them with a similar amount of plays regardless which is around 62 to 63 which i think that's i don't think cleveland's ever going to be real up tempo no matter who's at quarterback the big difference would be the pass you know the called pass rate you'd assume they're calling a lot more pass plays if it's watson versus Brissett. so i have it more like 58 percent. ben has it 55 percent, and again that makes sense given the assumption yep. at quarterback it's as far as quarterback goes, I mean, the Watson stuff really just comes down to what the suspension is. Um, it's one of those things where I think it's a good lesson in not swinging too wildly on the market until we have some news where there was a stretch where he was probably going too early. And uh, I think our ranks were guilty of that. But then there was a stretch where people were like basically had him as undraftable. Before, and now he's like back to like QB 15. Um, so just try and you know keep it cool on the market with stuff like that much easier again to draft and redraft because you could just drop him week one yep. if he's not the guy especially if he slips late um pretty easy to take uh Brissette, I have no idea. I, my my projection was just more of any like it, rather than do the team with both qbs i was like i'm just going to start with percent i think percent plays some of the games this year and then whenever i figure out the the watson number i'll you know, include those, or if he misses the whole season, then I don't have to make any changes, but more just like a convenience thing for me as I went through it. I was like, I'm going to just start with Brissett. That's the only thing I know right now. Let's go to the running back position. Now you have more rush attempts or a little bit more rush attempts for Chubb. We're honestly pretty close on our Chubb line overall, uh, which is about 240 to 250 rush attempts, around 30 targets, expecting him to be Pretty efficient on the ground, rush for 1,200 or so yards, eight to nine touchdowns, very explosive player. He's a player in the past that I think would have just gone too early and was kind of, you know, an easy fade. I like him better, a little bit better in best ball where like it's similar to the Dobbins, like kind of like a rich version of the Dobbins conversation where we don't have the health risk, so he's more expensive. But it's like if you're going to give him to me in round three, yeah. Best ball where like having a running backs just churn out decent weeks, even without maybe not having the huge upside is good. Like I'm pretty happy with that redraft. Uh, sometimes I'm leaning wide receiver there. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm comfortable taking him in the third, especially in best ball for the reasons you said. I mean, I, I, I do really like to draft in the talent. We have a pretty good idea that Chubb's one of the top mm-hmm. five, if not one of the top three. I would put him in the top three peer rushers in the NFL. So you can talk about like upside. Yeah, he doesn't really have great upside overall or full season upside because of the targets, but he does have that explosive play potential. We've seen so much. He can put up the big weeks. You know, you can play Nick Chubb in DFS, right? Like sometimes because he can have yeah. a 60 yard touchdown run. So he does provide stuff with his just immense talent level, even though it's not like a great fit for like PPR scoring system. So He's always been a really hard player. We are getting enough of a discount now that especially in, in best ball, like you said, where just having like an anchor running back that can that can be as good as he can be is uh it's pretty huge. I mean, I I, I like him in round three in, in that format. Yeah. Uh Cream Hunt, I have for less work than you. Wanna talk through this one? Cream Hunt's been someone that I've routinely been on the past few seasons where I I like the hybrid combination of he goes late enough that he's kind of worth it at his floor, which is going to be efficient stuff on the ground and catching some passes. And the upside is your Chubb gets hurt and he takes over my concern with hunt this year, the rush yards over expectation stuff, which I, mean, I don't put a ton of stock into that, but Chubb and Dearness Johnson just absolutely crush in that metric. And then hunt was kind of below average. So it was like a, especially when you're comparing across teammates with the same old line and same scheme and stuff, that stuck out to me. And I'm a little worried if Chubb went down, you know, Dearness might actually become the primary rusher and, and Hunt's role would stay similar. How do you feel about Hunt Dearness as the backups here? Um, I guess I think Hunt would still be ahead in that scenario. Um, mm-hmm. Part of this gap, because we're close on Chubb and Dearness, is just that I'm, I have them way more rush heavy and probably kind of just see a, ceiling to how much they'll use Chubb. So if they are very run right. heavy, I'm thinking it's kind of a Chubb hunt thing and Hunt's work is kind of dictated by how much they run, right? Like they they're there's going to be more rushes. And I think we've play. seen that. Like we've seen right. games where they rush 20 times and it, Chubb has a really high carry share. And then games where they run 40 times and Chubb Chubb has this almost the same amount of raw carries and then Hunt's the one who pivots. Yeah. yeah. And that's basically what how I would describe the projection here is like I, I, I think Hunt's interesting because I do think he's a – I mean, Dearness changes the math a little bit, but I do think he's a similar bet to where he was in like the sixth round in recent years, and I didn't really mind, mm-hmm. mind him there. He's been a good receiver. We both have him for 40 catches. We have his receiving line providing some value. It's just a question of like how much rushing could he get and does he have contingency-based upside if, if Chubb misses time. And Dearness does change that math, but now you don't have to pay sixth-round price. You can pay like ninth or tenth-round price, so – and there's talk of Dern is getting traded. There was talk of Kareem Hunt getting traded for early earlier in the offseason. More more recently, you know, the, the big ESPN article that everyone was quote tweeting, uh the you know, the biggest observations from 32 camp, uh the 32 camps from from the ESPN beat writers, their reference on uh Cleveland was sorry, my daughter just came in and waved at me. But they <laughs> <laughs> their uh no, on Cleveland was they expected Dearness to get traded. So if he were to get moved, obviously that takes that out of the equation and Hunt's price becomes really favorable. Or if Hunt for some reason got moved. I mean, I don't know that that would necessarily be better for Hunt. But yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. Where are you at on it? Like he's cheaper this year than, than in the past. So we've been below market on Hunt right now. He's cheaper, but like a lot of the running backs are cheaper so it's it's somewhat relative so i guess like i prefer chase Edmonds to hunt yeah i think i prefer Ramondre to hunt right now he's probably in that tier but have him more back end of that tier and i mean a lot of it does come down though that like do you is d Ernest cutting into the work in base at all if not, that's really good for Hunt's standalone value without any sort of injury. And if Chubb gets hurt, how much of that does Hunt take? And uh, I guess we, we've just been a little bit bearish, and that's more feel based than anything. Like, I don't think we have this is where the educated guesswork of the projection stuff comes in because I don't think we really know one way or another how it's going to operate. Yeah. I've been irrationally drafting a lot of Dearness Johnson super late. Like I, I he's a talented just, back though. And, and if he got moved, yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense super late. He's a guy I've been on as well late. I mean, 
this has been you, you mentioned i mean hunt's rush yards over expected maybe not amazing but multiple backs in this offense i think hunt's had better rush yard numbers in prior years i don't think he was as good last year if i'm not mistaken right but um the good run game good offensive line what's that the touchdown stuff though like the efficiency on all these backs could just be really really good if watson's there i mean they you know they haven't had really a high scoring offense they've been good at times with baker but not like high powered necessarily and yeah so i might look into hunt a little bit more i do think your point about it being i mean there were times i was taking him in like the fifth sixth round a couple years ago where it wasn't it wasn't that much different than now i think my target expectation for him in previous seasons was higher and then again just there wasn't the earnest to worry about right let's go to receiver amari cooper the clear one here he just really doesn't have much competition as far as targets go you have him for 118 targets i have him for 110 i have him for more success off the targets than you do. I'm guessing some of that's like the Watson Brissett yeah. stuff, though. Uh, you're assuming Brissett. I'm assuming Watson, which would make sense given the efficiency. I think Amar. There was for a stretch, Amari was really. I mean, he's still kind of undervalued. I think. I think he should be going before wide receiver 30. I don't know if I like. I absolutely love him in like the early 20s, but FFPC right now he's wide receiver 31. I think that's a buy just because there's enough talent and there's just such a lack of competition that you know, the target should be pretty good for him regardless of who is that quarterback. Yeah, I guess I'm – I mean, more – there, there's some split stuff with him, right, where he's been better on turf and in domes. He was always better mm-hmm. at home with Dallas. I don't really love him playing outdoors in Cleveland, windy games late in the year, um, just sort of based on some of that stuff and – how some of the stuff went, went, you know, in his later years in Oakland. I it, it, again, very field based. I do have his efficiency nuke because of Brissett. I, I have a note that I, I nuked all the wide receiver and tight end efficiency, and even still, yeah. I have Brissett looking more efficient than he's ever been as a passer. Like Brissett's not a particularly efficient passer, um, so I, I had to take down a lot of these guys from where I would have them if I had Watson. And so that if Watson's in, certainly, yeah. I mean, I think you're right on Amari. I really want to like David Bell. His price is really cheap. He's someone that you could see too, maybe being a little bit less risky with Bruce. Like like Cooper, if you're investing like decent draft capital and like you need him to make big plays down the field and stuff, you know, there starts to be a lot more risk to that type of profile if it's Brissett. Whereas you're know, someone like David Bell, you know, maybe he just compiles a lot of catches with Jacoby right. Brissett. Didn't love that he was on pop. He got placed on pop, which right now doesn't mean a whole lot, but it was the first I had heard of some sort of foot injury for him. So it sounds like that's pretty minor from what I okay. heard. Um, shout out Pat Curran, who was talking about him in a, a chat I was looking at that, that he was saying that it sounds pretty minor. He put some screenshots of stuff that I didn't get a chance to read yet, but I'm assuming it, it backs that up because that was the kind of the conversation. But um mm-hmm. Bell as a player, as a prospect, sort of the Jarvis Landry, Keenan Allen mold, not super athletic, didn't test real well at the combine, but a very good target earner all through college, very strong production metrics. Those tend to be pretty predictive. Good route runner, you would assume, can earn volume. I do like everything you just said, like being sort of in the shorter, intermediate, underneath range, and then also just being in an offense where there is some room for him to potentially earn targets early in his career right like we saw that with jarvis landry coming to yeah he has to play if he's healthy like it seems like yeah like who i mean they've got like these wind sprinters you know schwartz and dpj like yep they don't have a lot of other guys it's amari it's bell it's the the tight end rotation those guys can earn some volume right i mean it's going to be i think both in joku and harrison bryant playing some um but bell presumably would have a path to being in that, you know, first four guys that is earning volume because DPJ is more of a wind sprinter, like you said. Um, so that's, that's the appeal to him. If you want to take some stabs late, I think. Yeah. And DPJ is a fun wind sprinter in best ball. If it's Deshaun Watson, like he's a little bit of a fun wind sprinter sure. as a stack candidate late in best ball, but it's been very efficient. I mean, he's had some big plays at, at times with, with Baker in this offense. And he, he really seems contingent on the quarterback play. Um, and Bell is the type of guy where I could see legitimate upside, like actually in managed leagues, taking play. A lot of these receivers we talk about, these secondary receivers, you know, I'm not taking them 
late just because like even if they do well it's not going to be super meaningful for the way i construct my teams but a rookie receiver that could potentially compile targets like bell is if i am taking someone late it's probably something like that in managed leagues we're both below market on david and joku uh we've bumped him like i feel like a fair bit and we still really aren't in line with the market on him um i just think the market's a little too hot i like Njoku, you know an incredible athlete someone that has a ton of upside they give him the huge contract which makes you feel good but it is a team that's ultimately really split the tight end role a lot and you know, my inclination is honestly a little bit closer to what you have which is 64 targets for Njoku, 49 for harrison bryant we have 71 and 41 i don't probably somewhere in the middle maybe is is the better representation of the range of outcomes where it could be this you know similar split as past years or Njoku could take a step forward this is where it's hard translating something like the contract stuff because and, and I find this with beats too, Ben, where like you get a beat that was like, oh, this guy's going to play a ton. And it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, what, what is, what do they think play a ton means? Right. Uh, and, and like big contract for Njoku is like, maybe they mean like he's going to get his 64 targets and be efficient and good. But that's like, that doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, they give him a big contract. He's going to see 80 targets now. Yeah. And Bryant has played a lot in both years. Even when they had three tight ends last year, he ran 158 routes. It's not a ton, but Njoku was only at 305 routes. So close to double, not quite double. The year prior in Bryant's rookie year, he ran more routes than Njoku. Uh, last year on a per route run basis, Bryant was right there with Njoku. was slightly above him in 2020. And Njoku's targets per run was a little bit better than Bryant's when Bryant was a rookie. I do think Njoku's you know, the lead, but... Even as the number three tight end, Bryant was running routes and he was doing all right. And I do think they like him still too on his rookie deal. I think that's part of why they let Austin Hooper go, not just to turn it all over to Njoku. Like you said, they, they've split this role. Basically have two good tight ends on a team that likes to let two run routes. Uh, Austin Hooper or Njoku or any of them has never really been like a really high route share guy in this offense. So I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think it's going to be split. I think they're going to earn targets per route at a decent or a similar clip, right? But Njoku is going to run a few more routes, but not like a ton. Yeah, I mean, right now we have Njoku for a higher target share than Hooper had last year, you know, by about a point, which is maybe a little bit aggressive. I don't know. Hooper was at 12.4% last year. Njoku was at 11%. Um, if you're looking at just at the games that they participated in. And then Harrison Bryant was at six. So in a way, it's almost like Bryant's going to see a bigger bump than Njoku. Like Njoku's starting yeah. at a higher baseline, but the actual bump might go to Bryant more so. And like, they're, I mean, we just wouldn't be shocked if a third tight end mixed in. It just seems like that's the way they operate. Yep. Well said. Let's go to Pittsburgh, the final team. We They're a difficult team to project because, you know, huge quarterback switch. What's that going to mean for play calling? Last year, they had a bunch of really short a dot high pass rate type games and that's just the way the offense flowed we have them around 63 plays i have them at a 61.8 percent pass rate you have them at 60.5 percent pass rate again a lot of uncertainty there to put things into context with big ben they were running 65 and a half plays per game at nearly 64 percent pass rate last year and then two years ago they were also above 65 plays per game and they had a pass rate of about 65%, uh, so even higher. So we're definitely expecting a little bit of a switch in play calling, getting away from Ben's noodle arm where they kind of <laughs> were forced to run those short dot routes. Yeah, but and, and they had a 64% pass rate last year. It was interesting because, I mean, they've basically been at that mark two years in a row. In 2020, they were really positive pass rate over expected team. Last mm -hmm. year, they were actually a percentage point to the negative in part because they're just, you know, in these other scripts, negative scripts, throwing more in, you know, in, in, in passing situations that force them to throw more. I'm basically expecting them to be a little bit negative pass rate over expected with, you know, Pickett playing or Trubisky playing, however that plays out. It's a, it's a, you know, early in their offseason, I thought it was going to be Pickett. Now I'm projecting Trubisky to play more. It's a tough offense to pin down for sure. Yeah, we're projecting Pickett for more right now. Some of that's like honestly just the way it works in our ranks. Like I think Pickett's more likely to be the guy at the end of the season where 
it probably matters a little bit more, but really outside of like, even in best ball, I'm not taking him, you know, um, maybe as a QB three, if I'm desperate in some builds, uh, super flex leagues, you're probably, you know, Pickett has to get drafted, uh, in some capacity, but you're talking real late, uh, at running back. We've got just an absurdly similar line on Najee Harris. We actually, to the decimal, have the same half PPR uh, projection on him at 239.4 points, which is pretty wild. Uh, 290 rush attempts. We're projecting about 75 targets. Najee is a tough nut to crack. I do think there's some legitimate talent for running backs and being able to earn a workhorse role and stay on the field, but... There's also a lot of downside when you're really dependent on that for a team that's a little bit shakier. You know, I don't, if this yeah. team goes south and if they decide to pull some of the running back volume, I don't know. It could, yeah, it could he look looks bad. like a guy who's going to get a ton of work, right? Massive rush attempt share last year, no backup additions. They're, they're still rolling with Benny Stell and Anthony and McFarland. It looks like those guys were not good behind Najee. It looks like they're just, you know, all in on Najee, which you'd expect. They took him in the first round and used him a ton as a rookie. At the same time, like you have efficiency questions on him, you have bad TD rates, you have efficiency questions for the backup running backs that, that emphasize that their offensive line isn't great, the, the offense isn't great. Only uh, 10 rush TDs as a team in 2021, which is like you need more than that. <laughs> um, even if he gets all of them, that's that's not great. You know, Ben's noodle arm, again, could have led to some of the the lack of running efficiency, just bringing more guys down in the box, not being afraid of getting beat deep. Maybe just more arm strength at quarterback can help a little bit. But I look at Najee and I'm like, this workload looks massive. You have to project it massive. I just said I don't project guys for 300 rush attempts. I'm projecting him for 293 because, like, I'm not projecting Anthony McFarland and Benny Snell to take a whole lot. And I had them a little bit on the like lean towards the run. At the same time, like, to me, it feels like the whole argument for Najee is workload. And that's the type of back I don't usually want to get in on in the first round. Yeah, and I also, you know, have a little bit of concern too that the target share maybe drops off without Ben checking down as much. Um, so if you get a you know reduced pass volume overall and then a little bit of a reduced target share, you know, what looked like a huge plus in the passing game is still a plus, but like maybe not a huge plus. So I've been below market on Najee. Like we don't have him ranked ridiculously below market, but he's someone that generally I'm just finding, you know, other players that I like. Um, I just like more than him. Behind him, it's a bit of a mess too. So I really haven't been drafting any of the like quote unquote handcuffs to Najee. You've got McFarlane and Benny Snell still there, I believe. You and I both seem to have them kind of evened out more or less as the backup to Najee. Yeah, I you, you like this is like one of those situations where you'd think trying to identify the handcuff would matter, but it's it's so cloudy. And again, they only had 10 rushing TDs as a team last year. Like and these guys weren't good. They ran for under four yards of carry. They were like, I don't want anything yeah. to do with the backups here. We'll go to wide receiver. And Deontay Johnson's another player that I've had difficulty figuring out what to do with. Because in general, I've been on the Ben is so bad train that I've been giving like Juju a bit of a pass. You know, Chase Claypool a bit of a pass. Deontay is tougher for me where... I want to give him a pass like on the efficiency side of things, but Ben was also so dialed into him that I do wonder if there's some some risk on the target share side of things just with the new quarterback. Maybe that's yeah, me being too much of a worrier. I'm not sure. No, I think that's a fair point. I will say you go back to Deontay's college profile. He had really good targets per out run numbers in college. He's done that in the NFL. Ben definitely locked into his number ones all throughout his career. You know, go back to San Antonio Holmes. You go back to whoever, Mike Wallace, Heinz Ward, way, way back. Uh, Antonio Brown, obviously. He, he did that throughout. So you can you can be concerned about it. I'm, I'm concerned about it. I, 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 and, like I, I wrote that I'm playing this as Deontay as the clear number one. I can see being wrong on that. Uh, and then I'm kind of playing it as mm -hmm. Claypool and Fryermuth are close as the, the second options. Um, I do think Fire Muth is really interesting. He he had a really good rookie year. He was overshadowed by Pitts a little bit, 
but we don't expect rookies to come in and be very good. He had a 20% targets per out run. He had the red zone work. People are talking about the red zone work like he was a bad thing, like he scored touchdowns. So we got to definitely expect to regress that. I mean, we're regressing it, but he earned volume at a good clip for a rookie tight end right away. Now there's more availability for targets with no Juju there in that in that shallow range. So, I mean, Juju didn't play a ton last year, but um, certainly opportunity for him to step into a, a solid role. I... For me with Deontay, though, like getting back to him, I just I don't really – who else takes it from him? You know, Claypool's yeah. a different type of player, so. And with, with that said, like ultimately I think – I have a bucket of guys who I feel like are somewhat similar in some ways, which is like Pittman, Deontay Johnson, and Terry McLaurin. And I've got Deontay right now has the best price of the three. So yep. uh, I do – you know, my concerns aren't that I'm mean that I'm not drafting him because I actually think he's the best value kind of that cluster of wide receivers. Uh, we'll I mean, there's a, you can make an argument for some of these receivers, and Deontay would be the one to make it for the most. That with the really high targets per run he's shown, if a, another quarterback can help his efficiency, he's not been particularly efficient. He yes. wasn't actually really efficient in college after the target. He has some drops concerns, and, and that's some of what limits his catch rate and his yards per target and that stuff. But he earns so much volume. If you can, you know, have a a good year with drops and have a good year with catch rate and yards per target and all of those things, maybe because of a, a quarterback with a little bit more juice in his arm helping him out there, um, he could actually like really blow up this year, right? Because he gets enough mm-hmm. targets and targets are like that's step one, right? And he he can earn volume. I've been really into Chase Claypool. I feel like i been way too hard on him. Like they just get bad vibes with Chase Claypool. But I mean, he was someone we were super excited about in Dynasty this time, you know, a year ago. Now he gets, I mean, the, I feel like the quarterback for him, like that situation can't be worse than it was last year. No Juju Smith Schuster's not there. I mean, you're going to let him fall to pick 100. I'm, I'm buying that all day, the way I draft. I think there's some boom potential here. I'm really into Chase Claypool. I do He's think been that, lining up in the slot, like some big yeah. slot wide receivers are exciting. Go ahead. No, I think that's all well said. Um, definitely can see taking him. It's concerning that they limited his routes down the stretch as rookie year, limited his routes some at times last year. They seem to like think that maybe he's not the most, you know, engaged player. And I don't know. There was some stuff in you know uh press conferences and stuff i'm thinking back to that uh i think minnesota game where he didn't get the ball spiked <laughs> yeah. or whatever uh but then the yeah. draft pick of george pickens i mean a lot of people talk about how the steelers don't pay the receivers they're probably going to let deontay walk after this year maybe the draft pick of pickens was more to refresh if deontay walks but he's an outside receiver he he, he is more of the claypool mold and I don't know. I, I see that as not a, a great vote of confidence in Claypool. I do agree with you, though. He is like cheap enough that you take some shots on him at that point. Yeah, I mean, just I think like the upside is definitely there, and you're you're sort of getting to the point where that that's all you care about, really. Um, why don't you talk about Pickens? Because I know he's a prospect that is, um, I guess, like a pretty exciting prospect, um, but didn't necessarily get. Where, where did he end up going in the draft? I think second round. Yeah. I actually don't. I'm not 100% on that. Yeah, round two, pick 52 overall yeah. for Pickens. I just know that Davis Maddock made fun of me for passing on Pickens in a, uh, for Jahan Dotson in a rookie draft. And then I got Pickens anyways because that's how you work the room. <laughs> he came in as a freshman and had a 28% targets per out run. His freshman year in college had a great freshman year. That number dropped off quite a bit his sophomore year, and then he tore his ACL, missed most of his third year, which was his past year, ran just 32 routes, came back and played a little bit part-time in the college football playoff. Entered a you know, volume at a good clip on that really small sample, but he that really good freshman year and the fact that he's a three-year early declare, got pretty good draft capital, those things all look good. He's just tough because we didn't really get to see. We, we saw a little bit of a, a slump his sophomore year when he was playing before he gets hurt, and then we didn't really get to see his junior year. Feels like a kind of a boom bust. That freshman year could foretell some real upside for him as a like he could he could be the best receiver in this class type of thing. Like that 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 is in his range of outcomes. At the same time, he could be a player that um, 
you know, it's now three years removed from when we saw him play at that level in 2019. He didn't quite play at that level in 2020. Like I said, didn't really play at all in 2021. Maybe he's not that same guy. You know, it's been, it's been some time. So you have the, the, the Steelers have a really good track record with the, with receiver picks. So um, I'm inclined to take some shots on him. Yeah. Uh, you are higher on than Pat Fryermuth than we are, but I just kind of upped our target share. I was looking at that a little bit closer. We had 76 targets. You had 94. I did up him just now. I cheated a little bit, Ben, before we got here looking ahead. I've got him closer to like 80 in the targets in the 80s now. Uh, but you you talked a little bit about why you're excited about Pat Fryermuth. And I think yeah. your points are very valid, which is like – he had more productivity early than we generally expect out of the tight end position. And like, I think it is like you shouldn't hold it against him that he wasn't like absolutely amazing. Like sometimes these guys that produce early people are almost too critical of how they played instead of just focusing on like the fact that they're like earning a role already is yeah, the most probably significant good, piece. Right. Like yeah, what he did his rookie year, makes it seem like there's a better chance that five years from now, he's one of the better tight ends in the league or three years from now, or this year. Right. I mean, it, maybe he doesn't take the big step forward in year two, but very good start to his career last year. Okay. That is it for the AFC North. Uh, looking at the schedule, we are going to do the NFC North tomorrow, which will be, Thursday, July 28th. And then we're going to finish up the final two divisions, the AFC South and the NFC South during the first week of August. Going to take the weekend off. Uh, it's been so much fun doing these. I can't believe we're officially more than halfway over already, Ben, which is pretty crazy. A reminder to check out Ben's Substack. He's got Stealing Lines and Stealing Signals, two separate Substacks you can check out. Uh, you go to bengretch.substack.com to get the details and can hear him on the Stealing Bananas podcast with Sean Siegel. You can hear me, of course, on this podcast, Establish the Edge. Make sure you like, subscribe to it on iTunes. Also, like and subscribe the Establish the Run YouTube channel. Helps us to keep doing content like this for free. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.